Well, it's a great honor to be a part of this program, and I would like to express my deepest thanks to the organizers of the conference and of this extraordinary exhibition. And following Arnold's truly dazzling talk on the prodigiously talented Giovanni da Udine, I think I have some inkling of how the modestly gifted Pellegrino da Modena must have felt when he first joined Raphael's workshop. Pellegrino da Modena is one of the more obscure members of Raphael's workshop. What little we know about him, which is very little indeed, is almost entirely owing to Vasari. A list of names in the biographer's hand, the skeletal table of contents for the first edition of the lives, documents that he had news of the artist and judged him worthy of a vita. However, the skimpy biography he penned ultimately proved too insubstantial to warrant an independent chapter. So in the expanded 1568 edition, Pellegrino was allocated a few pages at the end of the life of John Francesco Pini. Not only did Pellegrino lose independent billing, he also lost an elegy and a eulogy, the generic and somewhat rambling preamble that begins Pellegrino's Vita in the 1550 edition was excised in the 1568 version, perhaps because Vasari felt the artist was unworthy of such an inspirational encomium, and the transcription of his epitaph was also omitted. Although Vasari is usually a reliable and substantive font of information about 16th century artists, particularly those who worked in Rome, his life of Pellegrino da Modena is not only perfunctory, it's also curiously vague and colorless. This a measure of his ignorance about the artist. Proof of the biographer's clouded understanding can be found in a drawing from his Libro dei Disegni, the sheet in Budapest. Inscribed in Vasari's hand at the lower left, Pellegrino da Modena. Compare it with the autograph inscription in the index that I just showed you. It anachronistically presents a stylistic idiom of the later 16th century and cannot be by our, by our artist who died around 1523. I would surmise that Vasari here confused Pellegrino da Modena with Pellegrino da Bologna, that is Pellegrino Tibaldi, as did Filippo Titi some two centuries later when ascribing to Pellegrino da Modena Tibaldi's contribution to the vault of the Cappella del Crocifisso in San Marcello al Corso in Rome. Tibaldi would be closer to the mark, though still wrong, as far as the authorship of this drawing is concerned. The sheet is generally ascribed to Jacopo Bertoia, and it's a study for the decorations of the Oratorio del Gonfalone, begun in the 1560s and far removed from Pellegrino da Modena. The same limitations that Vasari showed as a drawings connoisseur beset his Vita of Pellegrino. A curious and frustrating paradox emerges from its laconic few pages. The projects and commissions he enumerates are for the most part lost, which is why I have no slides of this part of my talk. And these are referred to in such vague and opaque terms and with such a conspicuous absence of descriptive detail and content that his narrative is all but irrelevant in trying to reconstruct what no longer survives. Conversely, the biographer overlooks still extant works that seem irrefutably to be by the artist, reinforcing the inescapable conclusion that he was not very well informed about his activity. Moreover, it's only from a passing reference in the Vita of another of Raphael's disciples that an otherwise unknown aspect of Pellegrino's activity in Rome, one unheralded in the artist's own Vita, is even recorded. And if Pellegrino da Modena had already become a blur to such a fastidious chronicler as Vasari only a few decades after his death, it's perhaps not surprising that later historians were even more confused, erroneously fracturing him into multiple personalities and mistaking the Pellegrino Munari and Pellegrino Aretuzzi referred to in early sources for separate individuals when both designations refer to a single artist, he being one and the same with Pellegrino da Modena. There are two exceptions to Vasari's hazy presentation. His reference to Pellegrino's most important Roman commission, the fresco cycle in the chapel of St. James in San Giacomo de Spagnoli, and his recounting of his tragic end shortly after returning to his native Modena following Raphael's death when he was murdered by a vengeful compatriot in 1523. My talk today will focus on Pellegrino's activity in Rome in the orbit of Raphael. 
I'll begin with works expressly mentioned by Vasari, followed by others that he overlooks, and conclude with some preliminary new findings relating to the now ruined frescoes in San Giacomo. First, though, I'd like to offer a few words about Pellegrino da Modena as a draftsman, or more accurately, as a draftsman monquet, because surprisingly, for a member of Raphael's circle, there are almost no drawings by him. We've already seen that by the time Vasari was assembling his Libro dei Disegni, Pellegrino's identity as a draftsman, if ever he had one, was obscured. A little over a century later, another early collector, Padre Resta, mounted in an album a drawing that he thought was by the artist. That album is now in the British Museum, but the drawing in question is missing, so we can only speculate on its style and appearance. And this is the page from the rest of the album with the detail of the section of the text referring to Pellegrino, the Pellegrino drawing that he had. I wonder if that untraced work might be this study of a Madonna and child with St. John the Baptist in the Morgan Library, which once belonged to Resta and has a long inscription by Jonathan Richardson, a later owner, recording Resta's attribution to Pellegrino. The drawing is very damaged, but even in its present condition, the composition's Raphaelesque character is evident. If Resta's attribution is based on some earlier authority or tradition, we may well be looking at a ruined drawing by Pellegrino or perhaps a copy of a lost drawing or painting by him. Modern scholarship has made little progress since the efforts of Vasari and Padre Resta. Two drawings have been ascribed to Pellegrino on the basis of their connection with frescoes by him, um, frescoes that we'll look at shortly. On the left, um, a drawing for the martyrdom of St. James, recognized by Bernice Davidson, and on the right, a study of St. Joseph, attributed to the artist by Dominique Cordelier, though their styles are obviously rather different. And a few more speculative candidates have also been advanced. Presumably, drawings by Pellegrino do exist and will eventually be identified, be identified with the feeble Morgan sheet, perhaps providing a starting point for expanding his almost non-existent graphic of. Although so little of his painted work survives, we know that Pellegrino worked both in fresco and on panel, a useful skill set that would have commended him to the industrious and overtaxed Raphael. The only late Raphael workshop project that Vasari specifically credits him with participating in is the decorations of the Vatican Loge. Pellegrino wasn't permanently employed by Raphael as a member of his workshop, and he was considerably older than Raphael's other pupils. Rather, he seems to have performed as a sort of independent contractor who was free to take on outside commissions, although at least some of those may well have come his way through the Raphael network. The frescoes in the chapel of St. James, begun around 1518, that we'll return to, is a case, our case in point. To begin with works mentioned by Vasari, almost all of which are lost, as I said, Pellegrino painted three figures in fresco above an altar in Sant'Eustachio. Like all the Cinquecento decorations of that church, these are lost, and nothing is known about their subject matter. But the statement that they were seen in Trando in Chiesa suggests a location near the entrance. Sant'Eustachio, where at least one prominent cardinal, Domenico Iacobazzi, had a chapel, was the locus of considerable artistic activity in the years around 1520. Two other Raphael Garzoni, Perino da Vaga and Polidoro Caravaggio, were also at work there on very similar undertakings. Vasari recounts, and in equally nebulous terms, in their respective vitae, that Perino painted a fresco of St. Peter there, which was striking for its extraordinary relievo, and Polidoro some figures in a small chapel. So we have three artists from Raphael's Bottega, all executing frescoes of figures, note that none are credited with having painted storie, in the same church at, roughly speaking, the same time. It's improbable, I think, that Perino's contribution, a single figure, was an autonomous work. Might his St. Peter, whose location in the church Vasari neglects to mention, have been part of the same campaign as Pellegrino's three frescoed figures? And might Polidoro's figures too, which like Pellegrino's ornamented a chapel, have been part of a common decorative scheme? Vasari rather vaguely says that Pellegrino painted many works in Rome, quote, both by himself and in company with others, unquote. 
Temporary collaborations and partnerships among some of Raphael's former Garzoni in the 1520s is an established pattern, as I've discussed elsewhere, and Sant'Eustachio may have been the locus of one such ad hoc arrangement. <coughs> Assuming that Vasari is a reliable source, it is certain that Pellegrino and Polidoro did collaborate on at least one occasion at this moment, painting the facade of a house on Monte Cavallo. Curiously, this information is recounted not in the Vita of Pellegrino, where we have no report of any such activity on his part, but in the Vita of Polidoro. Facade painting was a specialty in which Polidoro and his shadowy collaborator Maturino came to exercise a monopoly in the 1520s. Pellegrino's lone recorded effort was carried out before that dominance was established. Presumably, a prolific career as a facade painter would not have been overlooked, so it's safe to assume that this was an infrequent and even unique undertaking for the artist, similar to the modest contributions in this field of Vincenzo Tamagni, another third-tier Raphael disciple. Another lost work by Pellegrino mentioned by Vasari is La Cappella dell'Altare Maggiore in Fresco Insieme con la Tavola in Sant'Antonio di Portoghese on the Via della Scrofa. Like St. Eustachio, that church underwent major renovations in a later period that likewise resulted in the complete destruction of its Cinquecento decorations. And Vasari's generic and clipped description is, once again, opaque. St. Anthony of Padua, to whom the church was dedicated, was likely represented in the lost altarpiece from the Cappella Maggiore that Pellegrino painted. <coughs> I propose that the Madonna and Child enthroned with Anthony of Padua and a female saint reproduced in this print, which has an inscription recording Pellegrino da Modena's authorship, may be that missing work. The enthroned Virgin and Child are very close in type to the same figures in this obscure fresco attributed to the artist, the obvious similarities suggesting that both inventions are by the same hand. The altarpiece was at Stafford House in Scotland in the 19th century when the print was made, but its present whereabouts were untraced until Xavier Solomon, investigating on my behalf, discovered just days ago, in time for me to make this PowerPoint, that it was sold at Sotheby's in 1970 and is now in a private collection. And here I should record my disagreement with Michael Jaffe's attribution of the painting to Lavinia Fontana on the basis of its similarity to a related drawing in Chatsworth that you see on the left. That has also, um, he also ascribed to that artist, to Lavinia Fontana. Most problematically, the drawing represents different saints than the two in the painting. The pose of the Christ child and the design of the throne are also different. Perhaps the Chatsworth drawing derives from the altarpiece, or perhaps both descend from an invention by Giulia Romano, whose style the drawing loosely evokes. But I would also leave open the possibility that the Chatsworth sheet is by or after Pellegrino. In any event, the very precise attribution of the altarpiece to Pellegrino, a by then obscure artist, recorded in the print, cannot be blithely disregarded, and the similarities of this composition to the Morgan drawing serve to mutually corroborate the attribution of both to the same artist. Four projects that Vasari doesn't mention seem to have witnessed Pellegrino da Modena's participation in some form. The first is the ephemeral decorations for the Festa di Agone in Rome in 1514, orchestrated by Tommaso Ingerami. Documents record that Pellegrino was responsible for three of the 18 triumphal chariots, those representing mirth, magnanimity, and fortitude. I believe that a group of problematic drawings for an unknown project, a group that has been assigned both to Peruzzi and generically to Raphael's circle, may be connected with this campaign. It hasn't been previously pointed out that one of the subjects in this group of drawings corresponds to the description of Pellegrino's decorations and the rest to other carriages in the series. If this proposal is correct, two possibilities arise. Either the drawing should be assigned to Pellegrino da Modena, a suggestion consistent with the long-standing but imprecise attribution to the Raphael workshop, or Pellegrino on this occasion was working from designs provided by Peruzzi, who's known to have produced such ephemeral decorations for festivals early in Leo X's pontificate, such as the 1513 Entrata. 
More work remains to be done, but one thing is certain. Pellegrino da Modena's participation in the decorations of the 1514 Festa di Agone establishes that he was in Rome by that date. This is a bad slide. The next year, in 1515, Pellegrino received payment on behalf of Peruzzi for an adoration of the shepherds, this now very ruined work, in the Church of San Rocco. The significant but unremarked implication here, I think, is that he may have had a hand in the execution of this now damaged work, which is often considered to be partly by assistance. It seems to me that would be a logical conclusion to draw from the fact that he was actually um, collecting payment for Peruzzi. If so, we can establish that Pellegrino worked as an assistant or collaborator of Peruzzi's in Rome before joining Raphael's circle to help with the Loge campaign. <clears throat> Pellegrino's presence there is universally accepted and need not be rehearsed here. Less widely recognized is his probable contribution to another little discussed Raphael workshop project. The frescoes in the chapel of the papal hunting lodge, La Maliana, carried out for Leo X. Begun around 1517, these were detached in the 19th century. The God the Father with angels from the semi-dome over the altar is preserved in the Louvre. This is a generic Raphael workshop production, an amalgam of appropriations and loose quotations from various of the master's inventions, and a competent demonstration of the Raphael house style, yet a work that doesn't bear the imprint of a recognizable or clearly defined personality like Giulio Romano. The somewhat wooden figures, stocky proportions, over large hands, and coarse features of God the Father, who lacks Raphael's grace, and like the flanking angels, displays a sort of exaggerated Raphael-esque morphology, point, I think, to Pellegrino's authorship, as various scholars have suggested. One comment from the otherwise unhelpful Vasari is relevant here, and that's his remark that Pellegrino succeeded so admirably in his work in the Loge that, quote, Raphael afterwards made use of him in many other things, unquote. What things those might have been go unmentioned, but the frescoes at La Maliana were conceivably among them. God the Father with angels is certainly by the same hand as the frescoes in the apse of Santa Maria Assunta and Trevignano outside Rome, representing the dormition and coronation of the Virgin, framed by two prophets seated on clouds. Pellegrino da Modena's authorship of this undocumented work was first proposed in 1962 by Maria Vittoria Brugnoli, who rightly rejected the traditional attribution to Perino da Vaga, and that idea has been retained in the ensuing literature. Once again, a literal and mostly uninspired recourse to motifs and compositions current in Raphael's workshop underlies elements of the composition and some of the specific figures. I show you here a drawing attributed to Penny of the death of the Virgin on which the composition is based. Um, these uh, prophets on clouds flanking the central scene, which are um, quoted from these uh, prints by Mark Antonio of the Evangelists and the standing apostle at the, life, at the left, who is clearly a quotation of Raphael's St. Paul from the St. Cecilia altarpiece. It's not much of a step from the clumsy quotation of Raphael-esque motifs in the La Maliana God the Father fresco to the liberal paraphrasing of whole invention seen here. Again, we see the stocky, somewhat coarse figures, peasant versions of Raphael's more refined types, with the stiff-jointed wooden limbs that seem to be Pellegrino's trademarks, but also, it must be said, a certain ambition in attempting complex foreshortenings and narrative drama that anticipates the St. James cycle. And the same muscular angels make an appearance in both inventions. Diminutive ancillary scenes from the life of the Virgin, the four scenes, uh, the four lower scenes reproduced in color here, call to mind similar vignettes in the Sotarco of the Pucci Chapel in the Trinita dei Monti, the two scenes at the upper part of the screen, one of the first independent commissions undertaken by Perino del Vaga after Raphael's death. That project was well underway by early 1521. 
I've always thought that these particular details are too crude to be by Perino himself and that some other hand is present here. And I wonder if we might not be looking at Pellegrino's intervention. If so, this would be yet another instance of some of Raphael's newly independent Garzoni pairing up temporarily to work on a specific campaign after his death. Having enlarged on Vasari's skeletal rendering of Pellegrino da Modena's Roman period, it remains to consider the artist's major work. The now woefully diminished fresco cycle illustrating scenes from the life of St. James in the Serra Chapel, also known as the Chapel of St. James, in San Giacomo de Spagnoli. The chapel's patron was Jacopo Serra, Cardinal Aboronese, one of two Spanish cardinals at the conclave that elected Pope Leo X in 1513, who was dismissed by pastor as being, quote, of no particular fame, unquote. That laconic assessment doesn't seem ungenerous. One of the few recorded incidents of Cardinal Serra's biography was his staging of a theatrical performance on the Feast of the Epiphany in 1513 for an audience comprised of Spanish dignitaries, prelates, and a large contingent of courtesans. Also present was the 12-year-old Federico Gonzaga, then a hostage at the papal court, whose tutor and guardian penned an account of the spectacle for Federico's father, Francesco Gonzaga, in Mantua. Quote, Master Federico was invited by the Cardinal of Alborea to witness a theatrical performance in his palace. It took place after supper in the main hall where his eminence sat between the Spanish ambassador and Federico, while the two front rows were occupied by several Spanish bishops and prelates and by the leading Spanish courtesans in Rome. The piece, written in Castilian by Juan de Lenzina, proved a failure. Cardinal Serra died in 1517 and made provisions in his will for the fabrication and decoration of his funerary chapel in San Giacomo. Documents discovered by Christoph Frommel established that work was begun in 1518 and completed in 1520. The chapel was designed by Antonio da Sangallo the Younger, Raphael's deputy in the architectural undertakings of his later career. That circumstance added to the fact that the patron was a high-ranking prelate and that the executor of Sarah's will, Cardinal Antonio del Monte, was appointed by Pope Leo X himself, all prompt the speculation that this major project, one of the most ambitious undertaken in Rome outside the Vatican's in the late teens, may have had some loose connection to Raphael or to the Raphael workshop. The choice of Pellegrino, a newly minted disciple of the master, to carry out the decorations under the watchful eye of San Gallo, couple maestro of other ambitious projects involving members of the Raphael workshop, would not contradict this imagined scenario. The lone preparatory study associated with the frescoes includes such an accomplished and detailed rendering of the temple in the background that I wonder, in fact, if that part of the composition at least wasn't based on a design by San Gallo. The chapel's dedication to St. James, patron saint of Spain, titular saint of the church, and onomastic saint of the patron, had a particular relevance to the Spanish cardinal Giacomo Serra. And the conception of the chapel's decorative program in which a monumental sculpture, the St. James by Jacopo Sansovino, stood over the altar as a centerpiece of an ensemble with surrounding paintings, seems to reflect Spanish conventions, perhaps in keeping with the wishes of the deceased patron, whose kneeling donor portrait was once to be seen to the right um, of his patron saint in front of the frescoed figure. The attendant necessity of decorating the chapel with scenes from the life of St. James must have proved a challenge. Rarely was St. James accorded a full narrative cycle. There was thus no established iconography or pictorial tradition to resort to, and written hagiography, brief mention of James's ministry, preaching, and martyrdom in the Acts of the Apostles, and in patristic sources like Eusebius' History of the Church, was equally scant. James was among Jesus' first disciples. He was one of the three apostles who witnessed the transfiguration, and he was beheaded on the order of King Herod. Medieval texts, including the 13th century Golden Legend, expanded the narrative, however, and it's the apocryphal addendum that Pellegrino's frescoes illustrate. Following a format for mural decoration devised by Raphael, gold monochrome basamenti, meant to em emulate relief sculpture, filled the lower walls beneath the principal narratives. 
These are now unfortunately illegible, but they must have illustrated minor episodes from the saint's life, with the large fields above dedicated to the principal events. The left wall illustrates miracles performed during James's lifetime and his execution, all in Judea. While the right, much of which is effaced, is devoted to posthumous miracles in Spain. Scenes from the first include the triumph of James over the evil sorcerer Hermogenes, a rare subject that was earlier represented by Frangelico in this panel now in the Kimball, um, a very different and much less dramatic formulation of the subject, and the apostle preaching to the Jews. The execution of St. James was also depicted on this wall, but it's largely obliterated. The central subject on the right wall is the miraculous appearance of St. James at the Battle of Clavijo in 844, when he led a vastly outnumbered and beleaguered Christian army to victory against the Saracens. As others have noted, the dense and dramatic composition abounding with energetic soldiers, straining horses and anguished antagonists, the vanquished turban moors, echoes the Battle of Constantine. Pellegrino's invention with its oversized billowing battle standards also harks back to the repulse of Attila and the stanza di Leodoro, another decisive Christian victory over the infidel achieved through divine intervention. Such subjects had a particular resonance in Rome at this time when calls for a crusade to counter the feared Turkish threat were a constant refrain in papal diplomacy. The battle at Clavijo thus takes up a political thread that's woven into a number of works commissioned by Leo X and designed by Raphael in the workshop. Entire segments of the right wall have vanished, but four previously unrecognized and unidentified fragments from these lost passages survive, I believe. These are preserved in Santa Maria in Monserrato, the repository of a number of works that were transferred from San Giacomo in the 19th century including San Savino's sculpture of St. James from the Sarah Chapel, which was replaced by the copy seen there today. These fragments, and I apologize for the poor quality of the images, some of the images, show straining figures carrying a body wrapped in a shroud in the presence of two oxen, St. James in the clouds, a bound young man in a white shirt being dragged along the ground, and a group of soldiers, one of whom carries a pile of wood. Even in their fragmentary and illegible condition, the subjects can be identified as episodes from the life of St. James in the Golden Legend. One scene, set in Spain, illustrates the command of Queen Lupa to the loyal disciples of the martyred St. James to, quote, take the oxen that I have in yonder mountain and yoke them to my chariot and bring then the body of your master and build for him such a place as you will. And then they made the sign of the cross upon the bulls and anon they were meek as lambs. Then they took them and yoked them to the chariot and took the body of St. James. The other fragments depict an event that occurred in Prato in 1238. A young man started a fire in his tutor's, tutor's field in punishment for which he was ordered to be drawn and burned. He repented and implored the intercession of St. James. Quote, and when he had been long drawn in his shirt upon a stony way, he was neither hurt in his body nor in his shirt. The scene we see on the left, and hence the emphasis on that white shirt. His punishment continued for, quote, then he was bound to a stake and faggots and bushes were set about him and fire put there too, which fire burnt at his bonds. And he always called on St. James and there was no hurt of burning found in his shirt nor in his body. And when they would have cast him again into the fire, he was taken away from them by St. James. Though the scene of burning doesn't survive, the soldiers carrying wood at the right must come from that part of the composition as presumably does the fragment of St. James interceding from heaven. Assuming the narratives on the right wall followed a chronological sequence, as do those on the left wall, the scene with the oxen was to the left of the Battle of Clavijo, and that of the repentant boy from Prato was on the right. 
Even if these woeful fragments were not recognized as refugees from the Sarah Chapel, Pellegrino da Modena's style and authorship still emerges clearly in The Blessing St. James, an echo of God the Father from La Maliana and any uh, number of other similar such figures and Raphael workshop inventions. In the ambitious but derivative Raphaelesque poses of the doll-like figures bearing the body of St. James, and most emphatically in the stocky, coarse-featured disciples to the right of the oxen, close kin to the apostles gathered around the Virgin's beer in Trevignano. I began this talk with the observation that very little is known about Pellegrino da Modena. That remains largely unchanged. We don't even have an idea, real or imagined, of what he looked like, because lacking his own chapter in the 1568 edition of Vasari's Vitae, he also lacks a portrait. I wonder, though, if Pellegrino may have left us an easily overlooked symbolic self-portrait in the background of the death of the Virgin fresco in Trevignano, where an anonymous pilgrim, a Pellegrino, sits on a wall. Maybe this is a witty signature of sorts, or maybe it's not. Ironically, such uncertainty is all that is certain about the strangely vaporous, elusive member of Raphael's workshop. Thank you. Thank you.